our last speaker for this morning is not really a speaker. Um, Randall Heath uh, is the owner and president of Cold Sweep, and he, which he founded in 2001. Um, and his company has been, he's gotten lots of awards and has been shown on Modern Marvels, um, cleaning smoke damaged books, and um, has been highlighted on the, in the Wall Street Journal. And um, so he's gonna give us, he's gonna give us a little introduction to his company and the demo that we'll see. As you saw, it's very loud, so it'll be easier to hear everything in here and then we'll go outside to see the demo. Um, and I just, it's really sunny outside and there's lots of stuff going on, so if you have sunglasses or something, um, I would encourage you to bring those along. So here's Randall. Thank you. Well, it's, uh, it's certainly a pleasure to be here today. Uh, uh, I've been involved in dry ice blasting since, uh, oh, the 90s. Uh, first as an engineer in the aerospace industry, and then for the last, uh, going on 17 years, I guess as a janitor, I clean things here, so. Uh, on the dry ice side of the equation, we use three different types of dry ice blasting machines. Uh, we use what we call dry ice dusting, machines, which would be similar to the Select 60 and a little micro clean that I have outside set up so that uh, we'll have a hands-on opportunity if you guys want to actually clean something yourself. We've got some really dirty stuff and some not so dirty stuff out there here. But uh, we also uh, use traditional dry ice blasting that uses an extruded form of dry ice, little pellets, and we also uh, use high pressure dry ice blasting that we do at two to 300 PSI to remove the really stubborn stuff or to remove the stuff that's not so stubborn, you know, two or three times faster here. Uh, that's probably not something that you guys are interested in doing. Uh, you gotta be careful with the, the delicate stuff. But uh, anyhow, uh, the machines that uh, we're gonna be uh, uh, demonstrating out there. One is a small tabletop unit uh, called a micro clean. Uh, it's about yay big. Uh, and to buy one of those for a laboratory setting or for small scale cleaning is about $28,000. The Select 60 that uh, William is using out there the machine itself is about $38,000. And then you can start adding compressors and all that kind of stuff too. But uh, you can rent the compressor if you don't have a everyday kind of use. So it's not quite as expensive as, uh, it's not quite as bad as, as, as you might think on the, uh, on the dollar side of the equation. But uh, I have uh, taken a little acetylene torch and smoke damaged some books with just the acetylene, so I've got like soot all over some books out there. I have some, uh, some uh, maple, some cherries, uh, some hickory that's been smoke damaged, some of it charred. I've got uh, old metal objects. I've got a straw hat too, so we can, uh, <laughs> I don't know how new it is, we can take a crack at that. Uh, we've got different nozzles. The, the way these two machines we're going to be demonstrating work is they'll take blocks of ice and there's a series of knives in there that will rotate, okay, and shave sugar-sized pieces off those solid blocks of ice that you're familiar with you get at the store. But, uh, and that drops into a feed system with, uh, you know, and, and it'll end up out at the nozzle. At the nozzle, uh, you'll either be using those sugar sized particles to clean or we have some specialized nozzles that have a screen in them that will break the sugar size into even smaller particles. Okay, so that uh, we can get, you know, a, a particle size that's maybe a little more aggressive uh, than just the CO2 cleaning that we were talking about earlier here uh, with the liquid CO2. Uh, so. Lots of different nozzles, lots of different machine types to match whatever kind of cleaning uh, situation that, uh, that you're faced with. Uh, we've used it to clean smoke damaged books. If you type in cold sweep smoke damaged books, you'll see some incredible footage of some, some books that we cleaned uh, at a, 
at a courthouse that caught fire. Uh, and Randy Silverman and I worked on that, I don't know, 10 years ago or something here. But uh, anyhow, so I've been doing dry ice blasting for going on 17 years, maybe longer than that if you count the aerospace side of the equation. And uh, we have some other technologies that we use when dry ice blast doesn't work. The, probably the most interesting one, uh, if you're dealing with, with metals, is we have induction stripping technology. It's a magnetic process, which means we have a magic wand. And if we move our magic wand over a piece of steel, we can unbond rubber, fiberglass, epoxy, coal tar, other really thick, nasty materials from steel with no noise or secondary waste, just peel it off in sheets. Uh, also works on rust. So uh, with that, we'll be moving uh, out. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll, I'll take a few questions in here because it, it may be a little noisier out there. But when we, when we move out here, uh, there'll be opportunity for everybody that cares to to, to do a little blasting, uh, and I'll I'll uh, I'll I'll give you some real brief training out there. But basically, you pick up the gun, and if you turn the on, there's the, you can arm it by turning it on or off, and then you have a trigger that you pull. Uh, try to remember when you set the gun down to turn it off, because if you pick it up, that trigger. It will be live if it's not turned off. But uh, we're going to be blasting it at a very low pressure too, probably around 20 PSI, so it won't be as noisy as what you heard there. That was a little bit my question, and maybe this is a no-brainer, but so we've seen it on metal and we've seen it on straw, and we've heard talk about it being used on paper. So my assumption is, I mean, you probably have a good idea of just what pressure to use for various materials, but I'm guessing is there's just a formula for everything that you're going to blast because you are putting pressure against that object. You know, if you start out, if you start out delicate, you just, you know, increase the aggressiveness until you get the, the results you're looking for uh, in, in in your field. You know, and the industrial cleaning that we do most often. We usually start at 200 PSI and just do everything at two or 300 PSI to get it done because we know that most of the things we clean are not subject to damage. We're trying to take coatings off. Now, that being said, we clean a lot of things that are delicate, like hydroelectric generators, uh, you know, that are that were built turn of the century, uh, well, turn of another century, the early 1900s. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's it's just like anything else. You know, you use what you've learned. Uh, to as a starting as a starting point here. So, but we're going to be doing it pretty pretty low. We may turn it up a little higher uh, if on some of the rusty thing. And I, I'll also say though that uh, the soot and the smoke and the and the and the charred wood that that may turn into a bigger mess than we want to deal with. <laughs> so well, I, I'll probably just do that. I'll get dirty and show you, you know, kind of a thing. And then we'll let you guys play with the straw hats and the wood and the and the, the regular wood and the the tools and the rust and that kind of stuff. If I could just for a second, um, uh, Randall was responsible for cleaning um, a number of documents that were mining documents that were coated in uh, dirt that was uh, had lead in in the dirt. It would turn out to be really difficult to clean by typical dry cleaning methods. Dry being uh, eraser cleaning, and um, we had had reasonable results. We didn't damage the paper. The, the lead turned out to be really pretty tenacious, so it was difficult to get it off. But so it can be taken down to the level of, of cleaning paper. So I think I know there's some inquisitive minds in this room. You know, there's a lot of work at the front end that could still happen ar around the delicate stuff. Yeah, and, and uh, also, you know, it's been some, some number of years ago, we, we cleaned portions of the only remaining example of an American-built clipper ship in existence, the Snow Squall, uh, and cleaning copper sheathing uh, and, and wood, uh, you know, from, from the shipwreck with, with good results. Uh, nothing's been done large scale, but the, the testing was very promising here, so. Has anything thing like this been tested on mud-covered books from um, floods, from the Florence flood, from 
Uh, you know, earlier this year we did uh, mud-covered rebar. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, there was some footings for a local hospital that got flooded, and I mean, these, the rebar was tied, it was like six feet deep, and it was a massive structure for a hospital. And we used it to clean all the, all the mud off the rebar, you know, uh, and uh, I just quoted a job for a company that had six, uh, 20, 20 or 30 large generators that were at the Port of Houston, and they're all mud covered. Uh, we've done mud, mud covered uh, uh, electric motors and hydroelectric generators. It works really well on mud. Uh, it creates dust. We, we put, uh, when we have dusty situations, we use, we make uh, uh, good use of uh, HEPA filtered air scrubbers. We got a bunch of like 2,500 CFM air scrubbers that will, that will eat dust all day long here, so. All right. So. I would just add that we have used it on, uh, on documents uh, for county courthouse documents that were in floods and it will definitely do a good job on that. The thing that you have to be careful with, if, it's, if the mud is really secure on the document, as soon as you get through that mud, you start abrading the document that's underneath. So it's mostly on the outside covers of these courthouse ledgers and things that we were working on, and it would remove the mud, and you just had to be very careful that once you got most of the mud off that you didn't start abrading the, the cover of the document itself. It's like, you know, like he was talking, you can adjust the aggressiveness, and so if what you're getting off has to be pretty aggressive, then you've got to be careful whenever you get to the, the item itself. Okay, well, uh, yeah, I'll go get set up.